Thursday, June 23rd, 2022. First item of business would be the approval of minutes of meeting of, well, special meeting of uh, May 19th. I would entertain a motion for approval. So moved. I'll second it. Okay, any corrections, omissions, additions? Yes, Ms. Blint. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, on um, page one, under Article 2A, Mr. Roman, which I think should be Mr. Romano, sent a 116 page proposed agriculture regulation. I think it should be six page. I do not recall 116 pages. I don't see a Mr. Roman anywhere, but I see Mr. Romano. Where are you? 2A. Page one. Oh, there we go. Okay, yeah. All right. Uh, make that correction. Yeah, I think we really would have remembered 116 pages. I'm mission. sorry. Excuse me. I've made some additional changes as I, uh, I put it in the... Um, up on, the, I've made additional changes and they will be in the final draft and whatever you find tonight. So okay. sorry for that. No worries, thank you so much. Thank you. Joyce, for your okay. great work. And then I think the only other thing on page one was um, in the uh, following paragraph, paragraph two under 2A, the very last word um, should probably be lowered. Oh, load, yeah. Well, those would be the cows. The cows <laughs> low. <laughs> and then I was going to get, I mean, TT went to go get you McDonald's. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Booth. Anyone else? All right, hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Chair votes aye. Those minutes are accepted. Moving on to the minutes of the Regular meeting of Thursday, May 26th. Entertain a motion for approval. So moved. Second. And a second. Any admissions, corrections? Right. Yes, Ms. Blint again. Yes, on page one, I believe it's uh, under item 2A, first, second, third, fourth, fifth paragraph. Um, B parentheses, the farming operation must have derived at $2,500. I think it might be derived at least $2,500 plural. Okay. Yeah. Like that. All right, anything else? Hearing nothing, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Chair abstains. Motions are approved. Continuing, Mr. Romano, where do we stand on that, Jennifer? Hi there. Oh, so, um, oh yeah, go ahead. Good evening, everyone. It's Aaron Romano, uh, residing at 55 Woodland Avenue, zoning changes for agritourism. I'm happy to report that I've met with some of the other interested parties who abut the property on our farm, and Ms. Rodriguez Valentino uh, at length. We went back and forth and made additional changes and incorporated some of the uh, suggestions that the commission brought up during the last hearing. And we have a final draft that uh, we believe uh, is acceptable to all the interested parties and also addresses the concerns that the commission has. So I'm happy to report that. It took quite a while to get that uh, draft done, but I think it's before all of you right now. The, uh... At, I, obviously, I was absent the last meeting. Was the hearing tabled at that point? Yes, it was. Okay, then we need a motion to get it off the table to continue. Let's make it legal. 
I have a motion to reopen the hearing, move it off yep. the table. Yep, so moved. I have a second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, we're back in business. Uh, for the record, Mr. Uh, Romano has testified prior to opening of the meeting that uh, revisions have been made with the cooperation of Ms. Rodriguez and uh, other people involved. And he now has a working, or we hope we have a working uh, final vision, uh, version of the zoning regulation. Uh, I assume that the public hearing was left with questions or comments from the commission. Uh, and if that is so, then all we have left to do, unless some commissioner has something to add, uh, is to move on, to close the public hearing, go back for a vote. Are there any comments from the commission? Um, I believe, uh... The director was going to review the changes and just walk through those before we close okay. the hearing. Good. Yep, Mr. I'd be glad to. Unless any any other uh, members have questions, I'd like to go through that. Um, the public hearing is still open. I do believe we have a number of people from the public that are here. Um, so that's up to the commission whether you'd like to uh, go ahead and um, give the public a chance to. Uh, make comment after I go through these. I think it would be a good idea. Um, I know this has been going on for some time, but it has been an incredibly collaborative effort for an application that's come from an applicant rather than from the town. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. Yes, it's just going to take me a moment because I have so many things on the computer uh, open right now that I'll need to present tonight. So just give me a moment, if you will. Okay, can all of you see this? The proposed amendment to the Bloomfield zoning regulations regarding agritourism. Yes. Yep. Okay. All right, great. So the applicant had um, a revision as of the last hearing, as you can recall. Since then, uh, the applicant and I met with some of the neighbors uh, just to gain further input and took consideration from previous hearings and previous testimony. And a revision was submitted this last Friday and the applicant um, let me know on Monday that he was okay with the changes as well. And what I've done since then is a bit of reformatting. So the way the applicant um, has proposed the regulation, um, the it was written as one section. And after going through your regulations, which are, are definitely, um, they're unique, they're different in, in the way that rather than having sections about agritourism and sections about you know other uses um, and a use table where you might have you know all of the uses listed vertically and the zones uh, horizontally, and then you're kind of looking for that axis, um, to see what's permitted and not. The Bloomfield regulations have sections by zone. And so you'll have that list of uses repeated in each section for each zone. And so the regulation as drafted as one section was really um, proposed to be under the special use permit section. But the reference to this agritourism use wasn't proposed to be in each of those sections in each of those zones for the zones where this is uh, proposed. So I did go ahead and add that. And I've separated the context. So I haven't changed what was proposed. But the way it was written had provisions for review by staff for certain types of uses. And uh, provisions for review by the commission for those that require a special permit. And so I've separated those out because in the Bloomfield regulations, we have 
uh, we have Article 7, which is special provisions for certain types of uses. And we also have Article 8, which is for special permits. So I'll go through here uh, the definition section first. The only changes here for definitions, you'll see when I go toward the bottom of the definitions here, where you see farm-based recreational activities, farm store, limited farm store, agricultural events, and non-agricultural events. Originally, there were definitions for winery, brewery, distillery. Those have been, now been removed because there was concern about uh, liquor related uses, the licensing that would be required for those and the uh, potential impacts. So those have been removed. Then you'll see and add to your article eight special provisions. So these are the provisions that don't necessarily need to go to the commission that um, would be permitted as of right with review by staff. Um, and for um, limited farm store, farm-based, educational, farm tour, and agricultural events. Uh, so there really wasn't much change here in terms of my formatting, but there have been changes that were uh, made between the last meeting and this meeting. Some of those changes that you'll see throughout the document include um, the hours of operation being reduced, and again, those liquor references um, being removed. So here in this section, you'd have farm stores, limited farm stores and agritourism. You'll see limited farm store as number one, farm-based recreational activities as number two, Three is educational demonstration and presentation. Four is farm store, uh, farm tours. Five is agricultural events. The, the number of events for agricultural events is at uh, up to 15 permitted uh, per calendar year. Permit application to the zoning officer for review and approval. Things like agri um, accessory structures, music and entertainment are still uh, listed here. So not much of a change. The music changed from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. to now 9.30 p.m. Uh, the review process and the types of things that need to be reviewed has uh, remained the same to mitigate potential negative impacts. <clears throat> and then there is language at the end of this section that says if proposed agricultural event does not comply with the above criteria, or if there is a disagreement between town staff and the applicant, the applicant shall be referred to the commission for a decision. If the commission determines a special permit approval is required, the applicant shall comply with the criteria in section 7.4. And then the special event section, uh, there was some feedback about um, potentially limiting the number of people for certain events, um, especially those that would uh, not require a special permit. Um, so those events have been limited to under 50 persons. And then multiple day and temporary permits. Um, the special events are uses for a period up to 72 hours for any one occurrence, not otherwise permitted in these regulations, may be permitted subject to issuance of a zoning permit by the zoning officer. And then it gives the provisions there, types of things that would be reviewed. Also states zoning officer may place stipulations on the permit, which is issued to protect health, safety and welfare of the neighborhood. What you'll see removed here from both this section for special provisions and for the special permit section is the uh, overnight lodging and camping. Um, the overnight camping seemed to be a concern and that's now been removed. <clears throat> Campfire uh, section remains that the fire pit is there only with prior approval, approval of the fire marshal. 
Eligibility is included now that I've separated them out into the two sections. That eligibility uh, remains the same at a minimum of 10 acres and at least $2,500 in gross sales, et cetera. Um, earlier versions of the regulation did not include this. So um, this has been carried forward. Gross sales may be demonstrated by submitting an IRS Schedule F or Schedule C, Certified Professional Accounting Audit or Documentation of a Federal or State Agricultural Grant. <clears throat> and then the remainder, remainder of this section really um, is unchanged. Okay. Uh, why don't we turn to the audience first? See if there are any comments. Uh, anyone attending wish to make a comment? And then uh, maybe before comments, I'll just say that um, I, I wrote that the add to Article 7 special permits, again, it's just separated out. There's really not much of a change other than those that I've mentioned. Um, a lot of the language is really just the same. It's just formatted differently. And Article 7 refers to special permits and commission review rather than staff. So okay. I'll, I'll leave this off to the side. I'll stop uh, sharing. Um, but certainly, if you'd like me to pull it up again or have a discussion about a particular section, just let me know. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Sure thing. Anyone in the audience care to make a comment or have questions? Uh, Very that's rare fine. You can go both. ahead. Hello, are you able to hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I just want to start by reinforcing what Jennifer and Aaron said. Uh, I'm one of the main people, one of the community members who worked with them in putting this regulation together. And uh, I think they were very responsive and very helpful in putting together something that's you know, fair to everybody. Uh, maybe nobody gets everything they want, but it's basically fair to everyone. And I think this is an excellent structure. Uh, my only concern is that because just in the nature of us meeting and conferring and scrambling to get this done. Uh, the actual final version of the regulations only came out today with the formatting and the separating of the different sections. Uh, at least speaking for myself personally, I haven't really had a chance to go through these very much, but I've already noticed that there is a problem with how things were separated. For example, the on page three, the special events, events under 50 persons is included in the agricultural events agritourism section rather than the special permits section, section seven, which it, in, in conjunction with the non-agricultural events, which is where that really needs to go because uh, non-agricultural events is where the 50 person limit, if you look at page one, really comes into play. And I, I know this is all a bit complicated, but all that is by way of saying uh, that I think given that these the final version only came out today, I would like to request that the commission not have any vote or, or close the record at today's meeting, but even if we could just have one additional week until next week's special meeting, and if we could slip this in on the agenda there, uh, to give all of us a chance who, again, this just came out today in final form, to give any final comments we may have for the commission's consideration. Uh, again, speaking for myself, I appreciate everything Aaron and Jennifer did. I in no way intend to blow everything up. I think this is a, I personally think this is a reasonable result, uh, but I would like a week to go through this final version and for the commission to go through it, frankly, uh, and to be able to give any final comments since we did just get this. Uh, and that's that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Claire Kindle. Yeah, yes. thank you. Go ahead. Um, let me reiterate what Mr. Klein said as far as thank you for removing the alcohol, thank you for removing the camping, thank you for setting aside the noise, letting that be dealt with through the town council, thank you for having 10 acre farms, this is all, that's all great. Um, again, and also thank you uh, to your town planner, to Jennifer, for providing this introductory int explanation between the differences between sections you know, Article 7 and Article 8, because I was, uh, I don't do this type of, of stuff and I was a little confused. I found a couple of things that I think need to be clarified and I do have two questions. Um, one, as I understand, 
7.4.C.1 sub 4, which is on page six of the proposed regulations. Um, there's basically unlimited entertainment as long as you have a farm store. And that the uh, entertainment would be not until you know, noon every day or until 930, but that there is no, um, uh, and it would be the commission could set conditions but that there was, it's sort of, we have 15 agricultural events, 15 non-agricultural events, but if the entertainment is associated with the farm store, it's just whenever the farm store is open. Um, now, presumably no one's gonna have entertainment 365, which is, was my biggest concern, but you know, there doesn't seem to be any sort of limits. Now, um, you know, there might be an explanation um, for that, or there might be sort of a, complies with noise ordinances, or I'm not sure what the story is, but I just would like some clarification to, on page six, what sub four means and how does that differ from the two sets of 15. Um, the other one was just on the sale of alcoholic beverages. Again, I, I can't thank you enough for removing the distillery winery stuff. Um, and I noticed that for limited farm stores, it's, the sale is prohibited, but it is silent for farm store. And I assume that means that there, that farm stores would offer some sort of alcoholic process, but there would be some process or permitting involved. And I would just ask for clarification as to what that means. Um, on page six, sub five, I think it's just a typo, um, but maybe if it's not a typo, then I guess it would need some explanation. Events are subject, so uh, events in 7.4.C.1 are subject to C2. Well, C1 and C2 have different times for music and they're not necessarily consistent. And so I'm not sure um, what the restrictions in C2 for non-agricultural events and how they comply, how the, the um, farm store events in C1 how those two interact and whether that sub five events are subject to 7.4.C.2 and the following, is that just, was that the right citation or if not, and if it is the right citation, how does it work? Um, but with that, um, again, I thank both um, town staff and Mr. Romano and this commission for their courtesy and uh, professionalism and patience with us as we work through this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Anyone else? Erica Fern. Thank you very much. And uh, I know everybody's worked really hard on this and uh, it's really nice that everybody came together to come up with such a great plan. I have a couple of things, two things that I'd like to have. One thing to be clarified, um, I didn't quite understand the changes when you said zones. Um, you mentioned zones. And maybe before you get to this, that this might be more simple. You had the overnight lodging removed, camping trailers, tents. Um, would that exclude a farm stay in an actual building unit? So we would like to be able to offer families to come and work on the farm and have that family experience overnight in one of our cottages that's on the property that already exists. So that was one concern. But if you could um, share a little more so I could understand the different zones. I, I don't know. It would seem to me that we should be in the business of governing what goes on inside people's homes. And although as an outlying uh, cabin, I guess we're getting into a real gray legal matter here. Uh, I don't know, Ms. Rodriguez, anything that you could add to that would be very helpful. So what I'm, what I'm doing is trying to make notes and then maybe I can, um, okay. after everybody- yes, that I've been doing the same thing. Okay. That Let's way that, that we kind of avoid one-on-one -on -one dialogue. Yeah. 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 
Okay, fine. Anyone no. else with a question or a comment? Thank you. Well, it looks like we've reached that point. Seth Klein, you still have your hand up. Is that an additional question or was that just left up? Mr. Klein? I'm sorry, I, uh, I was on mute, but no, I did not have anything additional. I just did not lower my hand, I apologize. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. All right, last call. Anyone with a question or a comment in the um, audience? All right, before we get to your wrap up, why don't we go through the commission to see if they have any comments. Ms. Blint, you're up first. <clears throat> No comments at this moment. <clears throat> Mr. Millett? Yeah, the, just under the, the regs there, I think it's just a cross-reference was a placeholder under 8.5.A.5, I believe. It was uh, XXX are prohibited. Um, I, I'm guessing that was meant to cross-reference to something that wasn't ready yet. Okay. Ms. Adams. I have a question. Go ahead. So section 8.5, Jennifer, I see where it says eligible, eligible um, farms have, have to have 10 or more acres. Uh, why did we move from nine? I thought the initial was asking for nine and Ms., maybe Mr. Romano can answer that as well. We'll get to that in the wrap up. Okay. Mr. Le I'm sorry, anything else Ms. Adams? That's it, sir. Thank you. Mr. Lester. No. no. Mr. Oliver. No comment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Ms. Rodriguez, you're on. Okay, thank you. Dan so Merrick, I think um, there. Oh. Can you hear Dan, me okay? Dan Merrick. Dan Merrick. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Dan. You didn't show. You're over there on my screen. Okay. I didn't know. Him. I'm, I'm actually on my phone because I want to throw my computer out the window, but um, oh, welcome to the club. <laughs> uh, I had, I had uh, a question um, along the same thing that uh, Michelle Adams uh, just raised. We have an eligibility in 8.5 B one, and I haven't had a long time to go through this, but this one jumped out at me of 10 acres. And then later on, and I did not circle it. There was a uh, contemplation of more than one parcel participating in putting together that 10 acres. Um, is, is it the concept that it'd be 10 acres by one owner or leased or joined or can just neighbors get together and, and put together 10 acres? Well, I would think that an applicant could only represent one property. Well, the, the two concepts are alive in this in this regulation, and that that's what's giving me the problem. Right, I, I see the problem. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, oh, sorry. Was that anything, anything else? else in? Um, well, that's the in the, the short amount of time I've had to go through this. That's the one that's in doubt right now. So, yeah, I guess that's it for now. You don't even think we may need this extra week? Ms. Rodriguez, you're on. <laughs> All right, so I, I just wanted to summarize the notes that I took and obviously we have the recording that we can work from. I would ask um, if Mr. Romano can come back on to make comment about a couple of things because I think uh, since this is an applicant uh, driven application um, and it's certainly been collaborative and I'm happy to have worked on this and uh, keep working on this until we get the questions answered. Um, but I wanna know what, what the intention was. So um, the, first, the first thing I um, wrote down was regarding the persons under 50 event and whether the intention was for that to be um, considered a non-agricultural event and uh, should that be moved to the special permit section? The, the intention was, I think the concern was from um, the other citizens was 
that with uh, under 50, um, we didn't want to have to apply for uh, a special permit uh, for the non-agricultural events. I do believe that's, that's the case. It was really the amount of people coming uh, to an event and then um, that event counting toward the numerical cap, uh, whether or not it's the agricultural event or the non-agricultural event. So what we wanted to do is create an exemption so that smaller gatherings such as uh, plant walks or um, yoga uh, on the farm or a drum circle or something like that would not count toward a numerical cap that would uh, incorporate a larger amount of people coming to a farm. So we wanted those sm that smaller number, that under 50 number to be exempt from either cap. Okay, so the, the interest was that it wouldn't count toward the um, total number of events and it would not require a public hearing? Yes. Anything else, Mr. Brown? Okay, so I'll I'll um I'll move on to there was a comment about the farm store and the music and entertainment that could happen in a farm store and whether that was intended to um, those live events were intended to count toward that that number as well. I think, I don't know if that was the question. I think that question was posed by Ms. Kindle. And I think the concern was, um, there was a, a confusion about the live music associated with farm stores. I don't know if there was a differentiation about indoor or outdoor, um, but I think what we agreed on as a, as a group, as a collaborative effort, was that any music that would occur, or any entertainment that would occur, would have to comport with the current noise ordinance. So just consider it like any other private party who would have any type of music or live music being played, they would have to abide by the municipal noise ordinance that's currently in existence. So that would be no different for any event on a farm regarding the farm store. So I guess, um... I guess the concern that I heard was that it could be happening every day. So that leads me to think that maybe there, there might be a conversation about um, the, you know, the number or the frequency. But that would be no, it, it, that could be a concern of theirs, but it's no different from a neighbor playing music and abiding by, and that's really what it is. That the farm is a neighbor to in a residence and that they have to abide by the noise ordinance that governs their behavior. So it's, it's no different from being next door to someone else and uh, they have to comport with that. And then the other, um, there was another item about sale of alcoholic beverages. I think the pro, um, the language was taken out of one and then in the other section there, it was that they were prohibited. So I just think that 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 was not taken out. I don't think the intention was that one would be encouraged um, and, and then the other is prohibited. Uh, for, for liquor uses, there is a requirement for, you know, a separate licensing and location approval and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, without any language in there, the, re the request would fall to um, whatever's in your current regulations. Um, but I can certainly look at that language again. And then. I, and, and if I may add, I don't think the absence of it uh, makes it permissive. And I think that's, that's, that's pretty clear that only the regulations have to permit the activity. And since the regulations don't permit the activity that the sale of alcoholic beverages either way would not be permitted. I understand that it has a prohibition in one, but. I'm just reading some notes. Uh, and then 
the um, there was a reference to seven four C one referring to uh, C two. I think that's something I'm going to have to look at. Um, and then regarding the farms day, I think the again, uh, if uh, Mr. Romano can make reference to you know what his intentions were, but I I believe the um, the farm stay language that was removed was really uh, meant to remove the um, camping use. Exactly. Yeah, my, my understanding is that uh, I believe it was uh, Mr. Lester's concern was that uh, the outdoor camping might be disruptive uh, to neighbor neighboring residences. So uh, that was a concession that we made to to move the regulations forward. I think what uh, Ms. Fern was referencing was more uh, cabin stays, so they would be in enclosed structures on on a property, and as long as I would imagine that as long as those structures are are um, approved through the through planning and zoning in the building department, that people can stay in those structures and stay on the farm. Uh, I think I, I wouldn't see why they can't, but that wouldn't be outdoor camping. That would be in cottages and in structures. Yeah, that would be my thought also. And then there was a, um, as as was mentioned, there was a section 8.5A5. Uh, there were X's there um, that was a placeholder. So I'm gonna have to take a look at that in terms of what it refers to newly now that the formatting has changed. Um, and then finally, I have a comment um, written down about the nine acres moved to 10 acres. And I'll ask if Mr. Romano can just address that as well. I don't know. I, I don't. I I don't recall how that got changed, but it, it really is of no significance. I mean, as as it personally, um, I guess as it personally applies to to me and my own self interest, it really is of no consequence. Um, I, perhaps I think it was mentioned in the last hearing about moving it to ten because there were some concerns uh, from one of the commissioners about uh, who would apply, who would be eligible under these regs. And I think the concern is to make the regs as stringent as possible so that um, people couldn't take advantage of them. So, so that's why we made those concessions with the income requirements and the minimum lot requirement as well. Okay, and then the, the only other thing I had written down to mention is just, you know, yes, as uh, was mentioned by, um, one of our uh, neighbors and attendees that did speak, uh, I did talk to the town attorney and the recommendation was to remove any reference to noise and have um, the activities default to uh, the local ordinance. Um, I also see that uh, Commissioner Mara has his hand up. If, uh, if you don't mind, there's one other question. Well, two, one is the question about the single ownership or multiple ownership still has to be addressed. And then the second thing on the non-agricultural events, their accessory uses on property for farming, but is that for ticketed like entertainment? Um, we're usually uh, kind of hard on selling tickets for places. Is that, is the intent here to like have a concert where people would buy a ticket and go? Yeah, so, so the intention would be to charge admission for entry to the, to the farm for an event. So that would be the, the agritourism component. So people would come to the farm as tourists, they would tour the farm and they would attend an event that would be a non-agricultural event. So it could be music that's that's presented. It could be a fair, uh, it could be a, an art show. It could be a lecture series. So you could play. bring in a band and put a band in the field and charge people to come in. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. And <laughs> Commissioner Blint. Hi. Um, other than needing more time to review the revised regs, we're talking about multiple day and temporary permits. What is the maximum number of people that could potentially attend one of those events? 
I can't imagine a fair, a festival, a car show, an art show with a maximum of 50 people, but I don't see any reference to the maximum number of people. Is there no max? I don't see a, a listed max. If, um, if Mr. Romano can just maybe make mention of the intention there. I think there was in an early version there was a max of 200. Thought so. Yeah, I don't know how that, I don't know how that disappeared, but that's certainly, I think, well, I, I think, think that's it, a fair number. Well, if you're talking about 200 people, we could yeah. be talking between uh, 75 and 125 automobiles. And I think that's what engendered the original uh, I, don't, I don't want to say uh, revulsion, but uh, let's just say apprehension of, of that, that number. Well, and I can I just I, I can just tell you from experience, I've had events at, at my farm, which is um, in a much more residential area than our farm, that have had uh, 200 people, and these are private events, and there hasn't been an issue with parking. There, there's been plenty of uh, plenty of parking, and I think that's incorporated into the regs, where the uh, the director has to approve the site plan, which includes right. uh, where parking is going to be. So all of that has to be pre-approved, and I think the director also has the um, the ability to, because the proposal is being uh, made to the director, the director can modify the proposal as well. So if there are concerns about uh, numerical caps, I don't see why the director could could lower that proposed cap. Mm -hmm. the, the, regs, the regs leave a lot of discretion in, in the director's hands for approval, so. Well, I suppose yes, and then eventually if it got to be pretty uh, epic, it would be back on our table. Um, yep. It would seem, it, uh, I'll make one last call. Ms. Campbell, you have your hand up again. I do, thank you. Um, having heard the answers, um, I don't see the difference between the farm store entertainment and the less than 50, except that the farm store doesn't have any limit on how many people can be there for entertainment. Um, and it's not quite the same as having your neighbors. My neighbors don't have 50 cars next to me and playing music every night because um, we're in a residential neighborhood. We're not running an entertainment venue. So I would propose, I would respectfully suggest that the unlimited number of events for under 50 people deals with the farm store request and that 7.4.C.1 paren four should just be dropped um, <clears throat> because there it is a no limits, the whole purpose of it is to have no limits, but there's no limits in the number of people and you know, their events under 50 also have to comply with the nose ordinance. So he gets the, you get the same benefit with your under 50, but we don't have this, you know, it's within that context of a limitation. I just propose that as a suggestion for the commission and Mr. Romano's uh, consideration, um, because at this point, a farm store entertainment has no limits at all. Thank you. Okay. One last call again, anybody? Sydney Schulman. Mr. Schulman, your, your microphone is muted, Mr. Schulman. <clears throat> Mr. Schulman, comment, question, we can't hear you. Yes, can you hear me now? No. Quietly. Yeah, yeah, as if you're <laughs> 20 miles away, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? No, not, not, not loud enough. I'm unmuted. You're unmuted. I can hear you, but it's very, very faint. I'm looking for something to try to turn it up. Uh, Is this better? No. 
Try turning up the volume on your computer, Sid. Exactly. Usually in the bottom right corner, there's a, a volume control. There should be a volume control down there, yeah. In the far right corner? Bottom Lower right. right corner. Usually it looks like a little amplifier with radio waves. Or just come closer to the company. In fact, that's exactly what it does look like now that I look at it. Is mm. that better? No. No. You've got to click on the amplifier that's shown in the lower right corner. And you get a scale that comes up with a bar that you can move. Yes, I did that. And uh, I you have to all the way click on the bar and move it over towards the 32. Okay. If you'd like, I think I can, I, I can hear, I can turn mine up pretty loud and then I can repeat the question for him. All right, well, we can try it, Mr. Shulman. <laughs> go ahead, what's your question or comment? Mr. Shulman. Oh no. One more time, Mr. Shulman. Seems he might have muted new. his his machine. Oh, he's got. Or maybe, a, maybe he can type a question into the Q and A. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if he's in transit or somewhere with a keyboard, but that's true too. It could be. I'll keep an eye out on the uh, Q and A as well, just in case. All right. Yeah. Let's continue. Um, I was about to say that it would certainly seem like we do need another week. This is becoming our cause for the year here. Any comment from the commission on that? Well, let me put it this way. I'll entertain a motion for a continuation, not for, that's gonna be, well, we have a special meeting coming up. We can include it in that. Yep. So I'd entertain a motion to throw it into that meeting also. Uh, and then, we can discuss it under the form of the motion. So I'd entertain a, a motion to once again, table this application and review it at our next meeting. So moved. Second. Okay, any discussion? Moved and seconded. Any comments, discussions? All right, hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The chair votes aye. All right, we'll invite everyone back for uh, June uh, 30th. And we'll go through this exercise once again. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Moving along, we have two public hearings. Both of them will be conducted under our usual process. We'll have an application by uh, a presentation by the applicant, a uh, comments from the town planner. We'll then open for questions from the audience, questions from the commission, comments from the audience, comments from the commission, and we'll allow the applicant one final wrap up. All right, Mr. Lester, do you have the public, uh, the legal notice for the hearing of uh, Lawrence Plant for an auto repair facility on uh, East Newbury Road. Yes, I do. Would you please read it for the record? Sure. Uh, legal notice, Town of Bloomfield, Town Planning and Zoning Commission, published in the Hartford Current on June 10th and June 17th, 2022. Notice is hereby given that the Town Planning and Zoning Commission will conduct public hearings at a meeting on June 23rd, 2022, commencing at 7 p.m. to consider the following. A special permit application of Lawrence R. Plant to establish and operate an auto repair facility with outside storage and as an accessory use at 20 East Newbury Road in an I-2 zone, KMS Enterprises, LLC is the owner. 
Thank you. Who's here to make the application or make the presentation? I believe we did get something from the applicant that they'd like to uh, table this, but I just want to be sure that there's no one here that wanted to uh, make any short presentation or any comment to the commission. So if anybody is um, here attending that wanted to speak, please raise your hand or go ahead and unmute. Yeah, it looks like we're shut out on all courts. All right, entertain a motion to table this applicant. No. Ms. Blint, were you raising your hand? I, you were waving or something. No, sorry. Uh, it was just heard noise outside the house. Thank you. Sorry. Uh oh. All we good. Have, FedEx. <laughs> okay, we have a. <laughs> We have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Any discussion? All right, hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Chair votes aye. All right, we'll hopefully see somebody on June 30th. Mr. Secretary, public notice, uh, public, uh, the legal notice. Well, Chairman Burson, can I just clarify? Um, they wanted to move it to the July meeting, not the special meeting on the 30th. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. That's okay. Uh, let's assume we went through that as long as we're putting it forward. <laughs> okay. uh, Mr. Lester, the legal notice for Douglas Street Ventures LLC on Douglas Street. Would you please read that to the record? Uh, legal notice, Town of Bloomfield, Town Planning and Zoning Commission, published in the Hartford Current, June 10th and June 17th. Notice is hereby given that the Town Planning and Zoning Commission will conduct a public hearing at a meeting on June 23rd, 2022, commencing at 7 p.m. to consider the following. A special permit application of Douglas Street Ventures, LLC, for approval to construct a 74,520 square feet warehouse slash distribution center with associated loading docks and parking. Property located at 59 and 69 Douglas Street in an I-2 zone. Owner, Douglas Street Ventures, comma, LLC. Thank you. Who's here to make that application? I am here representing the applicant. Mr. Denali, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rhodes. Appreciate it. Uh, yes, for the record, I'm Peter DeMalley, President of Design Professionals Offices right across the Missile Bridge in South Windsor, uh, 21 Jeffrey Drive. Uh, just President again of Design Professionals Inc. Um, I just request, Jennifer, if you could uh, admit uh, four people from the attendees list into panelists. I'd be glad to. Just let me know who. Yes, okay. Can we go back to, well, uh, I'll tell you, it's um, uh, Charlie Nyberg. He's the okay. fourth one down. Okay. And then Gina De Pasquale. Yep. And Glenn Martin from our office, landscape architect. And also Mark Bertucci, who with Gina is from Fussell O'Neill. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And that takes care of that part. Um, let me, we're going to first go to this exhibit. And the real purpose of this exhibit is, oh yes, can we share a screen? Mm -hmm. And I believe we'll be sharing uh, here from our office at Design Professionals, uh, Daniel Jameson and I will be uh, sharing. And all I believe we'll be sharing uh, here from our office at Design Professionals, and Jameson and I will be uh, sharing. All the what was that? It's an awful echo in whatever she was saying. Yeah. Am I echoing? No, oh, no you're not. She was. Oh. Am I echoing? Uh, no, you're not. She was. Oh. Oh, okay. Okay, should, may I proceed? Sure, go ahead. Okay, thank you very may much. I for proceed? Sure, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for okay, It is so, not going. Am I it echoing? Is not going. 
Mr. DeMeo, you're, you're fine. Am I echoing? Well, I'm fine. Okay. I think uh, anybody uh, that um, isn't well, speaking okay. should mute because I the board is hearing a echo speaking from speaking our own because yeah. the We're getting an awful lot of rebound okay. here. During my initial presentation, I'm the only one going to be speaking until I turn it over to Daniel Jameson, our engineer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Burson. Okay, so again, Peter DeMalley, uh, President of Design Professionals, 21 Jeffrey Drive in South Windsor. Uh, I'd like to tell you that we're, we're going, I'd like to review this, but first let me just introduce the site to you, if I may. Uh, so we are uh, just to the north of the, uh, of the Teamsters Local 671 Union Hall, which is the northwest corner of Britain and Douglas Street. So that's just off our southeast corner. And then to the west of that and behind off to the southwest of us uh, is the um, all pallet recycling facility, a manufacturing enterprise. Uh, and then also to the east of us is the Pratt & Whitney measurement business. I've been over there before, met with them. Uh, then also to the north of that is the uh, Fast Pitch Nation, right there, Fast Pitch facility. Uh, and uh, to north of that, I believe, is a Hartford Floor Supply, if uh, my records are up to date. Uh, and then on the north side of us, um, further up the street is the Tennis Club, and then way up the street is Cottage Grove Road. Uh, but there's a landscape business just to the north of us uh, along our northerly property line. So we are at 59, which is the northerly part of us, 59 and 69 Douglas Street, and we wrap around 63 Douglas Street. All, all in the I-2 zone, everything's in the I-2 zone, everything around us is completely industrial uh, in terms of zoning. So we'll move on uh, to the next exhibit. And that is, uh, let me first introduce our staff, the team for tonight, by the way. Uh, we, Douglas Street Ventures has assembled a design team comprised of uh, st my staff from design professional is me, uh, as a planning principal, and also uh, we have Daniel Jamison, who's a project manager here. He's a licensed professional engineer and he's a civil engineer for the project. And also Glenn Martin, who's a licensed professional landscape architect in the state of Connecticut as well. And he's also a project manager at Design Professionals. Uh, Glenn will be joining us remotely from his home. Uh, also, Charlie Nyberg uh, is an architect from uh, Shadler Cellnow Associates of Farmington. Uh, and he's the architect for the building. Uh, also uh, from Fuston O'Neill, we have uh, Mark Bertucci and Gina De Pasquale, uh, and they're from Manchester, Connecticut. And not with us tonight uh, is Jim McManus. He's been attending the wetlands meetings, uh, Inland Wetlands and Watercourse Commission meetings, and he is from New, uh, JMM Wetland Consulting Services in Newtown, Connecticut. So that's our design team. Uh, we've been going through a process. We submitted to you and to the Inland Wetlands and Watercourse Commission back in February. Uh, it was received by the Wetlands Commission in March. Uh, we had our first hearing in April uh, and that was continued. Uh, there were uh, many suggestions for modifications. And then we subsequently had our uh, big meeting with the town engineer, deputy town engineer and wetlands agent. Uh, and uh, then we uh, submitted again in May. Uh, the May meeting could not go forward at wetlands uh, on their end. Uh, and then also a special meeting in early June could not go forward. A, issue at their end as well. Uh, and then we met for the second time with the Wetlands Commission uh, last Monday night, uh, where they closed the hearing and did not make a decision other than on a wetlands map amendment application. Uh, so their continued, their deliberations are being continued to their July meeting, which I believe will precede your next meeting in July. So we, uh, so that's a process we've been going through. Uh, I'd like to uh, just now describe the development proposal, if I may, uh, in summary. Uh, at present, we have uh, just shy of nine acres, 8.728 acres. Uh, it's mostly a wooded site uh, and has some wetland areas. There are four small wetlands isolate pockets. Uh, the largest one uh, is uh, just the west of 63 Douglas Street. Uh, and then there are two smaller ones to the south of that. Uh, isolated low function values. Uh, and then we have a little tiny one along the westerly property line at the midpoint. Uh, the total wetlands is, uh, I think it's 0 0.18 acre. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a very small area of the site. 
Uh, now let me continue on uh, with what we've got here. So we've got, as I mentioned, uh, we're in the I-2 zone and we're surrounded by I-2 properties uh, and, and, and a wide, wide variety of uses around. Uh, there is a single family home uh, out on by Douglas Street, the extreme easterly portion of their property is their yard and their residence. And there's another residence to the north of the, uh, on the property containing the um, uh, landscape business enterprise in the north. Everything else around there is industrial or recreational in nature. Uh, under and pursuant to the approved uses uh, in the I2 zone. So we've got, uh, we're proposing a building that's 74,520 square feet. Uh, it's a warehouse use, which of course requires special permit approval from this body. Uh, and that's uh, at the Northeast corner of the property. And it has a uh, 5,000 square feet uh, office component within that. So it's primarily warehouse space. And then there's a, a office at the off the Southeast corner that Charlie Nyberg will be describing later on this evening. Uh, the building is one story uh, and the maximum height will be 44 feet. Uh, we have 108 parking spaces distributed between a 72 car parking lot on the southerly side of the building uh, with access directly from Douglas Street. We don't wanna have access uh, to and from uh, the building and the, and the cars for the employees and visitors uh, to interfere with access to the uh, industrial activity uh, for our industrial building on the west side of it. Uh, we have uh, 20 loading docks on the west side of the building. Uh, that's opposite uh, Douglas Street. So as not to interfere and have view from uh, Douglas Street uh, for aesthetics and other purposes. And then we also have um, 108 parking spaces. So there's 72 on the south side. Uh, and then there's another uh, parking area on the extreme west part opposite the loading docks. Uh, there are another 36 spaces. And five of the handicapped spaces out in the front of the building on just south side of the building are uh, handicapped accessible. Uh, we also have in our original proposals we submitted in February, uh, which has changed and I'll describe that in a moment. Uh, we have uh, 55 trailer spaces, and that's connected to the loading court uh, via a 30 foot uh, industrial driveway, uh, and which goes out to Douglas Street through the trailer parking area. And so we have an entrance, yeah, yeah, so that's, uh, hold on, <laughs> let's go back down to the trailer parking area. So we have an exit onto Douglas Street from the trailer parking area as proposed originally, and uh, then we have uh, an entrance for the employee parking, uh, and then we have an uh, a one-way entrance for the uh, for the trucks to come in, and that's so there won't be blind-sided um, uh, parking, uh, up, backing up of the trailers. Uh, we like to have it so that you're looking over your shoulder, the driver being on the left side of the uh, tractor, uh, and they can look at the area that they're backing into for safety for pedestrian and other safety of property as well. So we like to design it that way, uh, and that's why we have the entrance from the north, uh, and they'll park in there, and then they can egress to this through the big driveway to the south out to Douglas Street uh, and they can even drop a, a, a trailer if they like at that point uh, so and then they can egress so that covers that part of it um, so then we uh, if we go to the next slide Daniel please when we submitted in May after meeting with town staff after that first met, meeting with the wetlands commission and getting input from the commission as well as town staff members uh, including Jonathan Tessie, uh, Sarah Cody, and uh, and uh, Peter Castaldi, um, we uh, so we, we resubmitted uh, to address stormwater drainage issues, wetlands impacts, uh, uh, and overall impact on the site. And we did some significant modifications to the plan. Uh, most significant of which is we reduced the trailer parking area from 55 spaces that you saw in the first plan uh, down to 40 spaces uh, net reduction of 15 trailer spaces at that time. We also modified um, uh, where we were doing wetlands mitigation. We had a small amount of wetlands uh, that were impacting at roughly 2,000 square feet. Uh, we reduced it to about 1,000 square feet. Uh, the two southerly wetlands pockets were originally going to be um, impacted significantly. Uh, in fact, uh, completely. Uh, they were low function and values wetlands. Um, and then, uh, and then the mitigation area originally was up by the, uh, the larger of the four uh, wetlands. Uh, and so what we did, we changed it this time so that we created an area in bulk 
um, around the largest wetlands, the most value of the wetlands uh, in this area here, so that we could um, uh, retain a, a fairly large tree stand and leave the wetlands alone and not even create the wetlands mitigation next to it. So again, it would leave the area in a natural state. Uh, and then we were, uh, uh, and then to the south of the uh, egress drive, the truck ingress and egress drive, we're going to create a wetlands mitigation area to the west of the smallest of the three uh, in that line uh, wetlands areas. Uh, so we did that um, major, major change to the plan. Uh, and then also, uh, and Daniel Jamison will review that, uh, we modified the detention basins at the recommendation of the town engineer and deputy town engineer in cons consultation with uh, Mr. Castaldi, uh, modified those a lot. Uh, uh, Mr. Tessie was interested in us reducing uh, the interception of groundwater. Uh, so we raised the elevation of the two detention basins to accommodate that. And Daniel will get into that in more detail, Dan Mr. Jamison. Okay, so um, I think I've covered those items. Let me go on to, um, oh, uh, and because we, and I'm gonna get into another uh, layout in a minute, uh, but because we uh, did not receive a determination from the Inland Wetlands Agency on Monday, uh, we're hopeful for that, but it didn't happen. Uh, they did close the hearing. Um, of course, you can't act on it. We, we have every expectation you'll be going to another night, probably our expectation is to your July meeting, which I believe will follow the wetlands meeting. Hopefully at the wetlands meeting, we'll receive an approval uh, and then we can proceed with the uh, TPC uh, for the revised plans. Uh, so we have, uh, uh, let me go to uh, a couple other factors. And that is that uh, we have, uh, also in the revised plan that was submitted in, on May 20th, uh, and Glenn Martin, our professional landscape architect at DPI will address that, but uh, we had a huge increase in uh, landscaping elements, lots of pollinators and that. Uh, so he will be discussing that uh, in a moment, uh, but we did major changes on that. Uh, so we, um, we look forward to his presentation tonight. And also we have, with respect to lighting at all, he'll get into that, Mr. Martin will. Uh, we have full cutoff site lighting fixtures and we're dark sky compliant. There will no, be no light uh, emitted off the property, subject property, and there's nothing into the sky above. So we're not illuminating the atmosphere, which is a good thing. Uh, of late, that's been the standard. Uh, and we're not required to do any buffers, although we have lots of plantings that Mr. Martin will review uh, uh, to protect any abutting properties. Uh, we have applied for uh, a number of, uh, under your regulations, you require for the use, it's a special permit. Uh, there are other things, so that's the warehouse use, warehouse distribution center use. Um, we also applied for a bulk requirement um, permit for going up to 60% for the building. In the original plan back in February, we had about just shy of 60% coverage. You know, normal for this zone is 50% impervious coverage. Um, we, in the second plan that we submitted in May and May 20th, uh, we dropped it down to I think it was 56% impervious coverage. And I'm going to be going through a plan uh, in a moment, uh, a conceptual plan that will reduce it down to less than 50% so we are no longer in need of the special permit if you like that plan. Uh, for That is for uh, a reduction in impervious coverage, as I believe you call lot coverage. Uh, also, uh, uh, for the parking, uh, we're requesting a 35% reduction uh, in parking. Uh, so we'll go from uh, 164 uh, down to 106 required, but we'll be providing 108, uh, at, uh, including five van accessible spaces, which is absolutely ample for this type of use based on our um, experience. Uh, we've been involved in hundreds of industrial developments uh, in our 36 year history of this company. Also, um, we're asking for consideration for grading within the 10 feet of the property uh, and also um, the slope uh, within the yards. Uh, and Mr. Jameson will be addressing that further as we move along. Uh, and also uh, that we have, and this is something Mr. Martin will address, we're requesting an increased height of the luminaires to 24 feet, um, uh, whether it's building mounted or on the, on the uh, 
uh, on the pole. Uh, so, uh, and again, this is, this is for safe, safety factors and Mr. Martin will address that uh, and the number of them. So we've got, what I'd like to do now is just introduce to you uh, what we're proposing. Uh, again, oh, by the way, just go back to the wetlands impact. We were originally in the original plan, 2,280 square feet of wetlands impact. And then we're down to 1,165 square feet, which is just about a 50% reduction. And, and as Mr. McManus had presented to the Inland Wetlands and Water Courses Commission, uh, the, the, the wetlands uh, on site has low function and values. Uh, but now going on to just the concept, if you could call that up, Daniel, please. Here we go. Uh, and zoom into the southerly part of the extreme southerly part of the property. Uh, if you recall in the other exhibits, we had down there, we went from 55 trailer spaces uh, with the trailer space on both sides of the uh, truck drive uh, and uh, including maneuvering room. Uh, so they're 55 foot by 12 foot loading spaces or, or spaces for the trailers. Uh, and uh, and then in the second iteration, we went down to 40. Uh, and we now, our client has agreed to propose only 13 spaces. Uh, and there are multiple reasons for that. Uh, one is that uh, there was concern expressed Monday night by at least one commissioner that this built Mr. Uh, Levesque, uh, Stephen Levesque, the applicant uh, who owns a manufacturing enterprise right around the street on Britain. Um, he, uh, uh, because he is doing, by, by the way, he's not normally a developer. This is his first venture as a uh, industrial developer uh, or commercial developer. He, uh, he does not have an identified tenant, uh, which is standard practice for um, warehouse distribution center type businesses in the e-commerce world. Um, they don't wanna to talk to you. You don't wanna to talk to them until you know what you have approved and when you can secure all of your approvals and when the building could be started construction and when it could be delivered to meet their schedules for the tenants. Um, because they, most of these tenants have, in certain markets, they have to meet certain schedules for certain square footage and meet their requirements. So we, don't, we do not know at this time exactly how many trailer spaces. The numbers of trailer spaces we started out with in February and in May were upon recommendation of experts in the field uh, who deal with the prospective tenants on a regular basis. Uh, and they uh, recommended that. But because we don't know that and the concern expressed by at least one commissioner Monday night, um, and we don't know what the requirements are going to be, our client is, the applicant is satisfied with uh, going forward with just 13 spaces, which reduces us below the threshold of 50% from previous coverage. So we no longer need that special permit at this time. And if and when uh, a tenant is identified, they're going to identify a tenant before they build a building, that's the expectation. Uh, so we'll be meeting uh, tenants' requirements. If we need additional trailer spaces, uh, we will have to return to the Inland Wetlands and Watercourses Commission for a permit. Uh, and we're also going to have to return to the TPZ for approval as well um, in a separate applications later on after, after this goes through this initial process. Uh, so our client's comfortable with that, um, but we may be coming back. But right now, uh, we, he would like to, our client, Mr. Levesque, would like to proceed uh, with this revised plan. So that's what we're doing. We know we're going to at least one more night of the hearing. Uh, we'd like you to continue it to your July meeting or the next available meeting. Uh, and so we're, we're going to address that at this time. Uh, so we are, uh, now I, uh, I'd like to just introduce to you um, Daniel Jamison, who is a project manager at DPI. He's been with us for a long time. And he is, is a civil engineer on, for the design, and he is going to review the civil engineering aspects of the plan. And Daniel, please come forward. Thank you. Good evening, members of the TPZ Commission. Um, Daniel Jameson, for the record, a professional engineer in the state of Connecticut and project manager at Design Professionals. And as Peter mentioned, I'm here to discuss the site drainage erosion controls and um, water quality proposed for, to support this project. Um, the existing topography of the site indicated a drainage divide uh, that occurs uh, approximately a few uh, hundred feet away from uh, Douglas Street that um, would send sheet flow from the east side of the property to Douglas Street and the majority of the rest of the property will sheet flow down to the western boundary line. Um, based on CT Echo watershed mapping, 
um, all runoff leaving this site, even the flow that would enter in the, into the existing um, storm drainage system for Douglas Street would ultimately make it to the north branch of the Park River, um, local basin of 4404-12. Um, the main design point for the project was ended up being the western boundary line as a result of the majority of flow that would reach there. Um, peak flows were evaluated for the 2, 10, 25, 50, and 100-year storm events um, based on the notion, National Oceanographic, Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA's Atlas 14 um, point precipitation frequency estimates, which uh, basically gives the estimated rainfall amounts uh, for each of those storm events. So to uh, detain the increase in peak flows uh, resulting from the proposed project, we are proposing two surface basins, as Peter mentioned. Um, these basins will both be dry basins in a tier system. Uh, peak floor water from the tra trailer parking area uh, would enter into the northern upper basin, or I'm sorry, southern upper basin, and then it would discharge into a lower basin that we have on the northern northwest side of the property, ultimately to be discharged at the uh, northwestern uh, corner of the property uh, onto the town of Bloomfield's land there. Um, we, uh, we did match all peak flows in our original proposal, but in discussion with town engineers on Jonathan Tessie and uh, Ms. Sarah Cody, uh, they, were, we, they didn't like how much groundwater interception uh, we were uh, pr proposing then. So they were comfortable with us increasing flows in the 50 and 100 year storm event if we were able to reduce the amount of groundwater interception, which is um, indicated in this new plan. Uh, we now have a bottom, the original plan had a, uh, starting at the bottom upper basin, had a bottom of 108.5, <coughs> the bottom elevation to be 113, uh, I'm sorry, 112. And we are, we were at 106.5 in the uh, Northern uh, lower basin. And we are now at 110 with the bottom. So we were able to have um, three to four feet or plus feet of uh, increase in the bottom of basin to reduce the amount of groundwater interception uh, proposed to detain or control stormwater from the site. And with that, yes, we will have increases in the 50 and 100 year storm. But uh, we felt that <coughs> the direct where we are directing <coughs> discharge, that it would ultimately get into a swell. Um, that is directly west of the town of Bloomfield property um, and then be conveyed to the North Park River Basin. That swell, uh, looking at FEMA mapping, indicated a um, floodplain elevation that was at least five feet lower than the top of bank for that swell. And then also we are a part of a 307-acre uh, watershed. Our site's contributing acre area is only 9.24 acres or approximately 3% of this um, 307 acre watershed. So we felt that in detaining the slow, the lower storm events where uh, you'd have more potential for erosion, uh, that in do, increasing the 50 and 100 year storm that um, with being such a small part of this bigger watershed, it would have a negligible impact on the downstream receiving area. Um, for uh, water quality, we are proposing four water quality units to treat stormwater runoff collected uh, from paved surfaces. There'll be one stormwater or water quality unit that will treat flows entering the lower, lower basin here. Um, there'll be another two other water quality units proposed to treat stormwater runoff from the trailer area. And also another one here uh, to collect runoff and treat runoff from the uh, connecting drive. Um, these, water, these hydraulic or water quality units, which are hydrodynamic separators, uh, were selected based off their ability to treat the water quality flow rate um, determined for the area draining to them uh, as recommended in the 2004 Stormwater Quality Manual. Um, regarding uh, ENS, we, uh, all ENS guidelines controls were proposed in following guidelines rec and recommendations made in the 2002 ENS guidelines for sedimentation and erosion control. Um, existing catch basins on the side of Douglas, our side of Douglas Street or in Douglas Street adjacent to the project will be uh, fitted with inlet protection as well as new catch basins installed. Uh, we have a series of diversion swells 
uh, that uh, will collect runoff from uh, disturbed areas and convey them to two proposed uh, siltation basins that will um, serve as a collection point for sediments during the construction process. Um, in addition to this, we'll have silt fence proposed at all downhill areas, especially to protect the wetland areas um, during construction. Um, and uh, in regards to Peter's mention of the three to one uh, special permit request, this request came from our basin area along the northern or the western boundary. We do uh, propose three to one slopes in that area to uh, uh, allow our basins to have volume to treat the uh, two to 25 year storms. Um, and then that we, we are within the rear yard line. So the special permit request uh, was needed. Um, with that, I will turn it back over to Peter, but I'll be here more than welcome to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, next, we'd like uh, to have Mark Vertucci and Gene Pasquale are coming on from Fuss O'Neill in Manchester, Connecticut. Uh, they're the traffic engineers and they did a, conducted a traffic impact analysis. And so they're coming on and we are sharing their screen. You got the screen up? Okay. And uh, so Mark, the floor is yours. Evening, everybody. For the record, my name is Gina Di Pasquale, and I'm a transportation engineer with Fuss and O'Neill, located at 146 Hartford Road in Manchester, Connecticut. Um, as Peter mentioned, I am accompanied by Mark Fertucci, a senior transportation engineer with Fuss and O'Neill. Um, we prepared the traffic impact study, and we're here tonight to review the analysis. Just to familiarize everybody um, with the area of the site, as shown in the image on the left, <clears throat> Um, the site is located on the west side of Douglas Street, south of Cottage Grove Road or Route 118. It'll be accessed via three site driveways. The northernmost driveway will be dedica a dedicated entrance for trucks. The middle driveway will be accessed for passenger vehicles and the south driveway will provide full access for trucks and truck parking. For the purposes of the traffic analysis, the intersections of Cottage Grove Road at Blue Hills Avenue, Cottage Grove Road at Douglas Street, and the site driveways were analyzed for traffic impacts. Turning movement counts were, productive by, were provided by the Connecticut Department of Transportation from October 2021 for the intersection of Cottage Grove Road at Blue Hills Avenue and new turning movement counts were performed at the Cottage Grove Road at Douglas Street intersection in February of 2022. The counts, the counts were then grown by a factor of 0.6%, which was provided by the Connecticut Department of Transportation to the 2023 build year. The grown traffic volumes include pending, any pending and approved developments that were identified during the analysis. Um, if you could click to the next slide, Daniel. Um, the, the trip generation was calculated using industry standard rates from the Institute of Transportation Engineers trip generation manual for land use codes 150 warehouse and 712, which is office space. The rates are generated using nationwide trip generation data for various land uses. The morning peak hour generates 40 trips total between the two land uses, which will be 31 entering and nine exiting. And in the afternoon, it'll be a total of 46 trips, 14 entering and 32 exiting. The capacity analysis was then performed using Synchro 10 professional software, which analyzes traffic using the highway capacity manual. This is an industry-wide standard. The capacity analysis is analyzed by comparing the morning and afternoon background traffic, which is without the proposed warehouse and office space, and the combined traffic, which includes the warehouse and office space trip generation. The intersection of Cottage Grove Road will experience no noticeable impacts to the network due to the traffic associated with the site and will experience no change in level of service. In the intersection of Cottage Grove Road at Douglas Street, the right turn and left turn onto Douglas Street, Douglas Street will have minor impacts resulting in less than one second of delay. The northbound left turn out of Douglas Street will have delay increases of seven seconds in the morning and 44 seconds in the afternoon. This type of delay is typical of an unsignalized intersection on Cottage Grove Road. 
And in addition, the capacity analysis is conservative and does not account for the median storage space available on Cottage Grove Road or the gaps in traffic that are provided by the surrounding signals. The two exiting driveways will operate efficiently at level of service A. The overall queue lengths will be increased by a maximum of one vehicle length at each intersection. And all the intersections will maintain enough storage length to accommodate the negligible increases in queue lengths. Upon the clearing of vegetation, we conducted a safety analysis and the clearing of vegetation will be done in conjunction with the construction of the site driveways. And upon that point, the intersection site distance from both site driveway exits will exceed the Connecticut Highway Design Manual criteria for safe egress from the site. In conclusion, uh, based on the results from the traffic analysis and given the minimal trip generation and overall impact from the system, the proposed warehouse and office space will not have significant impact to the traffic operations within the study area. Myself and Mark Vertucci are available for questions at the end, but at this time, we're gonna turn it back to Peter. Oh, we're good now. Uh, thank you very much, Gina. And we are now going to roll over to Charlie Nyberg uh, from Shadler Cellnow uh, in Farmington, Connecticut, who's the architect for this development. Uh, so, Charlie, you are on. Although Charlie is muted. Hopefully, Charlie, you can unmute or be, he can be. Am unmuted. I, am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Yes. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Commissioner, Commissioners. This is Charles Nyberg, Project Architect at Shadler Cell Now at 5 Waterville Road in Farmington. Uh, as has been explained, I won't go into a lot of detail about what Peter has already touched on. The building is uh, 70,000 plus square feet. Uh, I believe we have, uh, again, it's been a while that we're at uh, 40, 40 plus feet of height. I think we're allowed a bit higher in this zone. Uh, just, it would be a steel framed structural framework for the building. Uh, we've noted bays, we've noted the uh, overhead doors at the uh, west side of the building. Uh, basically, the building, as has been mentioned, is a single story, one floor at grade. We have a 5,000 square foot office area in what would be the southeast uh, corner of the building. But this type of structure as a warehouse distribution in today's world becomes more of an automated type of facility uh, where the rack, a racking system uh, goes into the building and it is automated uh, in terms of a product comes in on a uh, warehouse delivery. It's then picked and brought into the racking system. And then by the same token, when something is needed, a group of things are needed for shipping. Uh, call goes out, the material is picked. It's set up in the plan at the uh, warehouse dock side of the building for packaging and what have you, and then goes out. The building is almost a square and would have an insulated uh, metal panel. We were looking at two different panel types, one being a fairly heavily corrugated for some shade and shadow, and then a smoother panel to give some relief and a breakup of the overall height of the building. Uh, at this point, we haven't gone into any color palette. Uh, that may be something that depending upon what Mr. Levesque is able to uh, achieve in terms of finding a tenant for the building. That particular tenant may have a branding that they would be looking for in terms of color. So we basically at this point are perhaps considering this as a basically a white vanilla box, if you would not vanilla, vanilla color, but basically a white box with final colors to be uh, determined once a uh, user has been uh, brought on board. Uh, again, I, there's a, a canopy over the uh, front, uh, what would be the 
west side of the, uh, I'm sorry, the east window area. There's an exit door. And then as it wraps around on the south side of the building, that would probably give us a bit of a color band above the office area. It's a canopy that would be hung from the building walls. So we have a small amount of windowing only again in the office area. The building probably because of its use would be fully sprinklered. Again, steel frame construction, insulated metal panels exterior. And uh, we have a series of exit doors that we've noted again, all to be finally determined once we have an end user. But basically, obviously at this point, we're dealing with the footprint that is being presented. And that would be what would be uh, what would what the end user would have to be uh, would have to live with. So that would conclude my presentation, trying to keep it simple and uh, answer any questions that you may have as you go into your deliberations. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Charlie. Um, now we'd like to go to Glenn Martin. Has he been uh, accepted, admitted as a presenter? I don't see him. Let's see, is he on the list? I've just added him. Okay, great, thank you. Sorry so about Martin, that. Who's not in our office this evening. He's a uh, remote in his house in the Western suburbs of Hartford. But he is uh, going, he's a professional landscape architect in the state of Connecticut, licensed, and he's going to be reviewing the lighting and landscape architectural plan, and it's become vastly more robust than what we came in with in our initial plan in February, uh, and he'll describe that, but just let me just tell you two things. Trees, number of trees have almost doubled from 32 to 56, I believe, and he'll confirm that. And I think shrubs uh, have uh, gone from roughly 100 to 429, he'll confirm that, but it's a huge number and we've got a lot of pollinators and stuff. So he'll discuss that, describe that. So Glenn Martin, please take over. Thank you, Peter. As Peter mentioned, I'm Glenn Martin, landscape architect with Design Professionals. And I'll talk to you about the landscaping. The, uh, the landscape plantings include plantings along the proposed Southern driveway. Red maples and oaks are proposed in this area. Service berries are also proposed which are medium sized flowering trees. Native shrubs will also be planted, which include red chokeberry, bayberry, and inkberry. The slopes will also be planted with a native seed mix. In addition to the plantings along the driveway, we are proposing interplantings of native shrubs in the existing wooded upland areas and wetlands, which are to remain. Many existing large trees will remain in this central area, which extends into the adjacent property. The shrubs that will be interplanted in these areas include spice bush, arrowwood viburnum, and sweet pepper bush. And that's in the center part of, part of the site there, right about there, yes. The wetland mitigation area to the south will be seeded with a native seed mix. Shrubs will also be planted in the mitigation area, including spice bush, sweet pepper bush, and arrowwood viburnum. Red maples and pin oak and swamp oaks and river birch trees will also be planted there to increase plant diversities. These plants will provide cover and food sources for wildlife. The drainage basins along the western part of the property will be seeded with native seed mixes. The seed mixes have a variety of wildflower sedges and grasses. The basin seed mix will include plants for pollinator habitat. These plants will also provide cover and food sources for wildlife. The basin slope seed mix will include additional native plant varieties. Along the slopes of the basins, Shrubs will also be planted. These shrubs will include sweet pepper bush, earwood viburnum, and American cranberry bush. Spice bush, bayberry, and red chokeberry are also proposed on the basin slopes. These shrubs will add additional food sources for wildlife. Along the western edge, trees will also be planted. These include red maples, pin oak, and swamp white oaks to the west of the basins. Evergreen trees are proposed as a buffer to screen the trailer parking and car parking along the adjacent neighbor's property. Never being buffer is also proposed between the trailer parking and Douglas Street to provide additional screening. Never being screen will include Norway spruce, white spruce, white pine, and white fir. These trees will provide cover and nesting habitat for birds and other wildlife. Along the building frontage, 
between Douglas Street and the building. Honey locust trees are proposed. Trees in the parking areas will include honey locusts, pin oaks, and red maples. In the rear parking lot, little leaf lindens are proposed. These trees will provide shade for the parking areas. And as Peter mentioned, from our initial plan, we're, we're adding many, many more shrubs in, in this latest version of the plan. I think we have up to at least 400 shrubs and over 50 shade trees in, in, the, in the landscape plan, which is very uh, robust. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about lighting. There's the light one. Uh, the lighting fixture proposed are LED full cutoff fixtures. They have a slim modern profile and are uh, very, uh, very nice looking uh, fixtures. We're asking for a special permit for 24 foot tall fixtures to provide safe and efficient lighting in the truck parking and circulation areas. 13 pole fixtures and three building wall lights will be 24 feet height. The remaining light pole fixtures and building wall lights will be 14 foot height. So uh, some of the fixtures will just be 14 feet tall. At this point, I'll turn it back over to Peter DeMalley and I'll be glad to answer any questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, obviously, uh, I presented uh, what we're calling concept plan A, but the uh, uh, modification with the 13 spaces um, on the southerly side. Uh, so won't we just go back to that plan? Okay, so with this plan, we'll blow it up a little bit. So what we've gone through from 55 trailer spaces to 40 trailer spaces in May, now down to uh, 13 trailer spaces on the southerly side of the access drive out to Douglas Street for trucks. So with that, uh, as Glenn just indicated, he was reviewing the plan that we submitted at May 20th, uh, but that will be substantially changed. So the area to the north of the trail, smaller, much smaller trailer parking area um, will have a substantial area of undisturbed area where the tree stand is remaining. Uh, we're not gonna be grading into it. So it'll just be grading uh, just enough uh, beyond the pavement uh, to accommodate the development. Uh, and beyond that, uh, it'll be uh, left alone for now, other than uh, we're proposing to interplant within the upland area and other areas. So we'll be doing uh, similar activities uh, in this area to the north of the uh, trailer parking area uh, in the in, in lieu of uh, the 22 spaces that were there on the latest plan in May, May 20th. So we'll be doing, preserving a lot more of the forest and doing some more interplanting and the, and the schedule for, uh, Mr. Martin will be modifying his uh, location of plants so that instead of up against the property on the south side of 63 Douglas Street, we'll be moving them at that out away from their property line for the supplemental evergreen other plantings. Uh, and, and so there'll be, uh, there'll be a number of modifications associated with that, but they're not major. Uh, so if the commission tonight expresses interest in the reduction in trailer parking to this latest plan that we're presenting to you, and we presented to, earlier this week to Jennifer uh, and to uh, Peter Castaldi, um, if you're uh, comfortable with this plan, this iteration, we will submit more detailed plans uh, from an engineering uh, and landscape architectural and land planning perspective uh, and lighting. Uh, so we'll adjust those uh, for the next hearing, uh, assuming it'll be in July or shortly thereafter. Uh, so we're available for that. Uh, we did provide in our narrative um, some uh, for your assessment of special permit criteria. We address such factors uh, as uh, suitable, it's a suitable location for the use uh, with respect to special permit review criteria, um, appropriate improvements, suitable transportation conditions, adequate public utilities and services, environmental protection and conservation issues, uh, long-term viability, and how it relates to plan of conservation development, in our opinion, it's consistent with it. Uh, so I won't go, since I have them in the narrative, um, I, I, we can address that if you'd like later on or at the next hearing, but I don't think I'll go into detail on those uh, because it's in writing in your application documents. Uh, so I'll forego that for now, um, but we can get into that if you'd like later on. Uh, so I think that wraps up. So we've been, we received presentations from myself, uh, from Daniel Jameson, my colleague from DPI, uh, Mark Bertucci's, uh, and uh, Gina Pasquale made the presentation with Mark Bertucci available as well uh, for questions. 
uh, and uh, Charlie Nyberg from Shadler Selnow, the architect, and Glenn Martin, our other colleague from Design Professionals, uh, the landscape architect. Uh, so we that concludes our formal presentation, Chairman Person. Uh, so we are um, available for any questions that you or staff should have. Uh, but bear in mind, of course, that we'll, we will have to go of necessity and by law uh, to another date uh, to extend yes. continue the hearing. Thank you very Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you for the record, uh, Jennifer Valentino Rodriguez. Um, I did draft a uh, memorandum. Again, it's only in draft and I didn't uh, pass it along because I did uh, understand that we would uh, just begin this review this evening and have the presentation for your commission. I, I did also understand um, the delay with the Welling Commission, um, but I will say that this has been a very um, responsive uh, revision and uh, including what was shown tonight um, that changes what is up in the screen to uh, allow for the possibility of reduced trailer parking. Um, thank you for that, that you've just put up on the screen. Uh, so in my draft um, memorandum, which I will uh, revise based on the feedback of the commission tonight and any further revision of uh, the applicant, um, I uh, did include a description, which I won't go into because uh, the applicant was so very thorough, but I will just confirm that the uh, property zoning in the area and um, in every direction adjacent to this property, you have an I-2 zone. Um, the zoning compliance table on the sheet uh, labeled uh, Douglas Street Warehouse and Distribution Center, uh, revised per staff comments and feedback from the Wetland Commission thus far to May 20th. The proposal meets the zoning regulations bulk requirements for lot size, dimension, setbacks, and height. Uh, the zoning regulations require no more than 50% coverage, but as the applicant mentioned, per your section 4.4.8.3, the applicant can request additional site coverage up to 60% with a special permit request. Um, and now as the applicant has commuted, uh, communicated to staff prior to this meeting and now to your commission, um, they uh, do um, have a possibility of reducing that um, and including the reduction of the trailer parking. And that would be in compliance with the uh, base requirement for the 50%. Um, again, as the applicant mentioned, and I do agree, your section 4.4 in the industrial district uh, does permit warehousing. Uh, so the use is permitted. Uh, the applicant did go into detail about the parking that is uh, both required and met for the employee and uh, customer parking. If people are driving in through regular vehicle, they do provide 108 spaces, which is compliant. And they've gone into detail about the uh, trailer parking. Uh, the applicant did show elevations this evening while they are not color or um, specific to um, material, again, in a color rendering, uh, they do indicate that once the tenant is selected, that's a, um, it would be at that time that they would select things like color and details. Uh, landscaping, um, thrilled to see the increase in landscaping, uh, the um, linear, uh, many linear feet of both uh, pollinator plantings and uh, basins that will slow and cool the water. Um, I do appreciate that response to all of the staff um, and commission input from the Wetland Commission. Um, I also appreciate the 50 trees um, and uh, many shrubs throughout that include native species. The applicant has uh, provided for compliant lighting fixtures, uh, as they mentioned, that are full cutoff, as well as uh, compliant levels of lighting. And um, your section 6.9 C, 8, B, and C do allow with a special permit that the pole height would in, um, could increase up to 24 feet rather than the base 14 feet that are required. Um, and so in certain locations, the applicant is asking you to include that in, your, in their special permit request. 
Um, I did look through, I don't believe we have any sign information again, because the tenant has not been selected. So I would just ask, um, I know this will be continued, but at the time that the commission makes any motion, if you could make part as part of the motion, whether the sign review would be delegated to staff or whether you would like to this applicant to come back to the commission for the sign approval. And then as the applicant mentioned, the wetland decision hasn't been made yet. So, so you'll be waiting, excuse me, until the next meeting to uh, take any action. I don't have any comments uh, received from the fire marshal at this time. And I'll hold off on any you know, possible motions or draft language for your use uh, should you uh, move forward with an approval until the next meeting. Uh, but before the next meeting, I will have draft motions and conditions for your consideration. And I'll include that um, in a revised uh, memo for you. That's all good. I have. Thank you very much. Anyone in the audience with any questions? Can we get the plan off the screen, by the way? I don't see any raised hands in the uh, attendee list, and right, I don't see anything in the Q&A. All right, then let's move to the commission. Reverse the order. Mr. Oliver, any questions? Mr. Oliver? <laughs> Is he sleeping? <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know what happened there, but he... There he is. He's back. It looks like the video is frozen. Yeah. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Mr. Oliver. We can't. You're not moving, but no we can questions. Hear you. No questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Lester, any questions? No, no, no questions. questions. Ms. Blint, you're muted. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a couple. Um, would the applicant consider uh, a more. Mute me. Or a an eco-friendly roof plan, something that is anti-heat absorbing since this is a pretty large flat roof structure? Uh, so what was it, your first comment? Uh, I mean, a more a reflective roof plan oh, that reflective? would reflect heat, yep, instead of okay. absorbing it. Uh, perhaps, uh, well, we can, we'll discuss that with Mr. Dyberg and with Mr. Levesque, our client, um, before the next meeting, but I, I like your suggestion. Let's see what we can work out. Yep, and then the only other question is, is there any interest on the applicant's part to purchase a residential property in the middle of the plan and expanding uh, these plans overall? Well, uh, I- If, I if can... the property becomes available. Oh, to, yeah, yeah. I don't know that it's available at this time. I haven't seen any for sale sign or anything of that nature. Um, for what we're proposing to do, um, including the reduced uh, trailer parking, we don't need it for the development. Um, but if it were to become available, we can we can discuss that with Mr. Levesque. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mara, any questions? Mr. Mara? Uh, no, no, I think I'm all set, thank you. Okay, <coughs> Ms. Adams. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Oh yeah, we can hear you. Ms. Adams. Ms. Adams? No, I'm all set, thank you. Okay, Mr. Millett. No questions. All right. Uh, you see there's no one in the audience who wanted to comment, so let's back up and go through some comments uh, from the commission. Get that out of the way if required. Mr. Millett, any comment? Um, just, I, I definitely like the amount of attention that was put into the landscaping and the plantings. Um, seems to be, uh, as was said, robust. So appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Adams, any comment? No comment, thank you. Comment. Uh, Mr. Mara, comment? Mr. Mara, you're frozen. There you go, no, you're not. Uh, yeah, I thought it was a very thorough and well-presented. Mr. Uh, Mara, you're frozen. There you go, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what's going on with my computer, but. It was a good presentation. I'm impressed with the uh, uh, the landscaping plan, and I like Ms. Blint's uh, um, idea about a reflective roof. Very good. Okay. Ms. Blint, any comment? Um, 
just kind of carrying over some insight from the uh, wetlands meeting on Monday evening. I know uh, majority of commissioners were interested in hearing uh, the thoughts of yourself, Mr. Chairman, who's also on wetlands and uh, another member who wasn't able to be there. There was some concern about um, marketing a building uh, like this and um, impacting wetlands at the same time um, unnecessarily. And I think that the, the applicant did a great job in responding to um, those comments with the uh, parking reductions and even uh, to the point of agreeing to put uh, maybe some beech trees on the property in addition to what uh, is already in the landscaping plan. There are a number of very mature 100 and 100 plus year um, beech trees there. Um, so I think overall, a very responsive plan. Thank you. Mr. Lester, any comment? Uh, no, I thought it was a very good presentation, very thorough. Um, that's, that's about it. Hey, Mr. Rock, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. Mr. Oliver, any question, any comment? Mr. Oliver? I said it was put. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Mr. Oliver? Have we lost him? Hey, he might be frozen. Yeah, it looks frozen. Yeah. Seems like a technical issue. Well, we'll catch him at the next meeting. I also would like to uh, compliment them on their robust landscape plan. Very impressed. Uh, we don't usually get that much uh, response from applicants. Uh, we don't usually get that much uh, response from applicants. Now I'm not going for some reason. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, I'm going for some reason. <laughs> little sir echo. <laughs> All right, we'll try to work our way through that. Well, obviously, we can't vote. We don't have wetlands approval. So I'll entertain a motion to uh, table the hearing and reopen at the uh, June, uh, part of the July meeting. I have a motion to that effect, please. Uh, part of the July meeting. I have a motion to that effect, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move to continue the hearing until the uh, July meeting. Thank you. I have a second. Second. Thank you very much. Any comment, Thank discussion? You. I have a second. Second. Thank you very much. Any comment, discussion? All right, hearing none and hearing it twice. Uh, all those in favor? All right, uh, hearing none aye. and hearing it twice. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 The chair the also chair? votes aye. Twice? <laughs> My goodness, I don't know. It, is that something in the town system or? I think, seems... it's, I think it's coming through uh, Commissioner Mara's. It, he, it's just what he's hearing is coming through. It's just a possibility. So if we don't all mute right away, you're hearing it come through our our um, speakers as if we're talking. It's, gotcha. it's pretty common in my experience. <laughs> you should have a tech here, I guess, at all times. All right, moving along. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate your consideration. We look forward to it further deliberations and discussion next month. Thank you. Okay, we'll see you next month, Mr. Demalley. Thank you very Thank much. You. Appreciate it. Thank you. Item five is a site plan application, Douglas Street Ventures. Uh, and I guess we'll just have to postpone that also, uh, the July That's meeting. Uh, I don't think we need a motion to that effect. It's not a public, uh, it's just, I think it's be the consensus of the commission that we just move that along in accompanying with the uh, 
total application. All right, item six, plan of conservation development update. Where are we? Glad to give a quick update. So we do have uh, two, um, two budget amounts, one from the previous fiscal year, one from uh, this upcoming fiscal year that was approved. And the intention was to include a strategic vision as well as the plan of conservation and development. So we did have two responses. They were both, um, you know, very thorough. We did conduct interviews. But what we did realize is that the scope that was in the POCD RFQ didn't emphasize the strategic vision quite enough. So our town manager, um, Stanley Hawthorne, uh, and myself and the purchasing agent, uh, we did supply a revised scope just to make that uh, strategic vision uh, more robust. And so we're waiting for responses from the two before we make a selection. And I imagine that will happen in the next couple of weeks. So hopefully by the July meeting, we will have a consultant selected and we can schedule a kickoff meeting finally. Wow. So that's really exciting. Yeah, took us a while mm -hmm. to get here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Any questions from anyone? Yeah, questions or comments from anybody? Um, just a quick one, Mr. Chairman, to sure. um, our town planner. Um, it sounds like you received the two responses, but needed to revise the strategic vision for the town. Um, was that because the responses just didn't really grasp um, that vision up front? Well, it was just the um, the way the RFP was written. It, the title was for a plan of conservation and, and development update, but then within that, there were sections that talked about the strategic strategic vision. So, the responses were very focused on the plan of conservation and development, which usually has an element of strategic vision, but strategic vision is a bit more thorough and longer. Um, you know, it might be twenty years. It might be more. There's just a ro more robust discussion gotcha. about, you know, who, who are we? What are we really looking for? Um, you know, a, a little bit more of like a, you know, I identity and more of the, um, you know, not just the more tangible things, but some more mm -hmm. of the, the, you know, the things that are harder to grasp just by the built environment. Um, gotcha. So I hope that helps just explain it a little bit more. It, it just wasn't as clear as it could have been. So both responses were very plan of conservation and development focused, a little bit more of the, the tangible built environment that results from the strategic vision. So gotcha. Thank you so much for that. Sure thing. Anyone else? Okay, moving on. See what helps if I put my glasses on. Maybe can read this a little better. Before we fall from town council, uh, we're back on Douglas Street. <laughs> uh, what can you tell us about that, Ms. Rodriguez? Sure. So I created a, it's just two simple slides I thought might be a little bit um, helpful, just as a reminder of the types of things we talked about, and then a snip of the actual um, statute because uh, while I'm sure you've um, had this 8-24 request come to you before, I know you have recently, um, it's just not something that you work with every month. So I just thought I would pull that up if that's okay with you. I will share my screen. Oh, go ahead. Oops. Okay. So everybody can see that okay? Yes. Yes, okay. So the, the process for approving the sale of land 
goes through the Town Plan and Zoning Commission because of the Connecticut General Statutes 8-24 requirement. And what you'll be asked to do is to make a report that goes to the Town Council about whether you would recommend sale of the property for residential development. And so um, it's important to point out that whatever the ultimate applicant prepares will go to your commission for uh, site plan approval and review just like, um, just like any applicant would. Uh, the question here really is not whether you're approving the details of the project because those are to be determined and will absolutely come before your commission, but rather is the sale appropriate for this use. Um, and in this case, I've put up the summary of the um, proposal, which would be a three-story 15,300 square foot floor plan, 41 units total ranging from 625 to 1,000 square feet. Uh, there would be 33 one-bedroom units, eight two-bedroom units, um, and then it goes on to uh, describe the types of um, interior and finish. Five of the units would be ADA compliant. Five units would be designated for low income housing and the balance at market rate. Uh, first floor, 11 one bedroom units and two two bedroom. It also includes a manager's office, laundry room, tenant storage and a multi-purpose room. There will be a patio and a kitchenette. Second floor includes 11 one bedroom units as well, three uh, two bedroom units, laundry rooms, again, tenant storage, multimedia room, and computer station. Um, oh, it looks like that's a, a repeat there. Um, I think that's meant to say third floor. Looks like uh, it. Includes 11, but one bedroom, three, <laughs> two bedroom units, laundry room, tenant storage again, and this floor would have a hobby and sitting room, director's office, and conference room. Um, and it says modifications to the existing design will reflect um, elimination of the multimedia room on the second floor and director's office room on the third floor. These two rooms will be converted for a different purpose, small fitness center, sitting room, library, or clinician room for spilt nursing. Um, the reason for inclusion in that is because the uh, applicant is considering that this would be for 55, age 55 and up. And so on the right, you see um, they've provided a couple of visuals for um, what the property could potentially look like in terms of its elevation. And then the second slide is that SNP from the 8-24 statute, no municipal agency or legislative body shall, and then I'm just gonna go through the highlighted pieces, sell municipally owned property um, until the proposal to take such action has been referred to the commission for a report. And then I've also highlighted if the commission does not report within 35 days, I believe you're at 28 days now. Um, so within 35 days of the date of the official submission of the proposal, it um, is taken as an approval. And then if uh, there was disapproval, uh, I've just highlighted what would happen then with the council, that it requires a two thirds vote of the council um, where one exists uh, to move forward with the sale of the property. Again, if the commission um, gave a, a report of disapproval. And then at the very bottom, I just put a sample motion whether it's approved or denied, uh, the Connecticut General Statutes 8-24 referral from town council regarding sale of town property for 15 Douglas Street for purposes of residential development. And I'm gonna stop share there. And then uh, what I can also do if, whoops, there we go. Sorry, my screen just went blank for a second. Uh, what I can also do if the commission is interested is pull up the GIS just to look at the area. Um, it is near the Gateway District. It is near Hartford um, and Windsor. And so people driving in from Windsor and Hartford 
uh, it would probably be the seventh or eighth property that they come upon. Um, Can you share a screen, Jennifer? Yes, sure. That'd be great. Thanks. Yep. There it is. Okay. There you go. Uh, so let's see if I can zoom out a little bit, just so you can see the town boundaries. So you can see that, um, can you see my arrow here? Uh, so if you're coming in from Windsor or you're coming in from Hartford, um, you have the cemetery here, the gateway district is this uh, salmon color, industrial district to the south, the lower half, of this property is already zoned for multifamily. The upper half is actually still in the residential zone. My guess for that is that that would need to remain open space or um, would be uh, preserved a bit more because of the natural resources there. Um, I wasn't here when that zone change happened, but that, that's my guess. I don't know if any of you um, were here on the commission at the time. I remember when um, we changed the zone, but I don't remember any uh, discussion of that parcel. Hmm. Yeah, so that the lower half is where the development would occur. Right. And so you have a lot of residential up here to the north of that property. To the south, you have industrial. I'll also point out, if you don't mind, this property that I've just highlighted, which is in the 800s um, along Route 187, uh, this is being marketed right now, and we've had multiple inquiries for multifamily there as well in the Gateway District. Um, so that, it's that, that's the area behind the gas stations. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's a gas station, and then a few other commercial properties yes. here. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's been up. Well, I don't know if it's actually formally presented, but that's been hanging around for a couple of years. I expect in the next month or so you will have an application. Okay, we have two, two inquirers that are very serious. Yeah, there was someone want to put a big box store in there at one point. Oh, that's not one of these. For, both are for residential. So I Good. hope uh, something comes forward soon. Yeah, there may have been one residential one too. Any questions or comments from members of the commission? I did have one, Mr. Chairman. Um, it sounds like there are five uh, low-income units in this um, in this plan. Um, yeah, I guess it's it's too early to speculate, but the other parcel. Is it likely that there would be additional low-income units if that were to be developed in that area? Oh yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't uh, seen a pro forma, you know, a financial plan or um, any sort of conceptual plan yet. Um, I I know that one. You know, I'm not saying much. I'm sure people are in negotiations and everything, um, but I don't even have a concept proposal. Um, that's been sent to me yet. Um, one well, how much seemed to think that it was just going to be market. Uh, the other didn't specify. What are we at in terms of percentage of affordable units in Bloomfield at this time? Mm, that's a good question. It depends on who you ask. So I believe uh, currently we're reporting between 10% and 14%, depending on the uh, data that you're looking at. I also know that Department of Housing's data right now appeared to be using 2010 census. So probably wouldn't be capturing our current number of housing units. And so that's gonna skew the percentage. Uh, so I do think Bloomfield, you know, we're meeting the numbers. Um, we might be chasing the 10% a little bit depending on when we go through the affordable housing plan, um, which that'll be coming up in the next couple of months too. Um, you know, we'll have a better understanding with real local data and in terms of whether we're closer to 14% or closer to, you know, 10 or 11. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Well, the motion should be in order. It looks like Byron Lester, you've got your hand raised. Yeah, yeah sorry, you didn't see that. Question. No, it's okay. Uh, I noticed they referenced they referenced the they referenced the uh, the low income. Is there any difference with low income versus affordable? Um, so I think that a property owner that that's rents, they can take things like um, you know Section Eight vouchers. But when there's a reference to low income, it could be any number of it could be any percentage of of income. So sometimes people will do what's considered workforce, which is you know a certain percentage under median income. Um, it it just really depends on which you know which percentage they go with so it hasn't really been specified which okay. percent of median income we, we it would have be. no idea what this is whether this is workforce whether this is low income whether this is affordable for the what, five what, units yeah that's correct okay so when will that be known uh when they come if the property is sold they would come forward to your commission with uh, their proposal Thank you, Jim. Good location for a gas station. <laughs> um, okay, so I'd entertain a motion for a referral back to the town council. Anybody? Somebody? I can so move. Somebody? I can make a motion. Thank you, Mr. Millett. Uh, I'll, I'll move. To uh, I was supposed to make a motion. I don't know, my, my pictures on my screen keep jumping around. I don't yeah. know where. I'll move for a favorable recommendation uh, re um, in regards to the Connecticut General Statute 8-24 referral from town council regarding the sale of town property of 15 Douglas Street for residential development. Not a second. Second. Someone going to second that? A second. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. We're echoing again. Chair votes aye. Thank you. Back to you, Ms. Rodriguez. Oh, oh gosh, there are so, so many updates. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, the biggest one besides the plan of conservation and development is probably the affordable housing plan. And so uh, a scope has been approved by the purchasing agent uh, because of the amount of money, it doesn't need to go out to RFP. Um, but rather I can send it out to, um, you know, probably the planning listserv. There are probably other uh, state sites that we can uh, send that out to and hopefully get responses um, in, within the month of July. Um, the, the inquiries are, are definitely up. I do expect another couple of applications within the next couple of weeks. And that wasn't even the, um, the property that I was just referring to near Douglas Street. Uh, so I guess it's just a little bit of a heads up that I know you've got your special meeting scheduled in June. There's a good chance you'll get a request for one in July as well, which is hard during the summer months. So uh, let's just keep in communication. I'll try to forward those along as quickly as I can and do these reviews um, in addition to uh, what's asked of me every day as swiftly as I can. Um, thank you for your patience. And uh, we do have three job descriptions going out. One has already gone out for another administrative clerk in the department. Uh, two others will include a deputy, deputy building official and um, an assistant for planning and zoning, which is exciting. I think we need it. The volume is up, the amount of good things and, and wonderful um, ambition 
on all the boards and commissions and the council um, is noted and we want to get moving on all of these things. Uh, so that's exciting. That's I do have a, a community report. It is pages long, but it includes project updates that I think you'll find um, interesting. I know as commission members, when you're out and about at the grocery store or just trying to live your life, you get cornered and um, you get inquiries. So I will forward that over to you um, in the morning. And if you have any questions, uh, let me know. But it's it's pages long and it's from, it includes uh, updates and highlights or exciting things um, from all of the divisions in the department. When you talk about up and about questions, uh, you neglected <laughs> to mention the 6 a.m. calls. <laughs> oh, yes. what, are you, what are you guys doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've had people follow me home, not in this community, but when I was in Windsor yeah, Long. Of course, yeah. People find me at lunch, even if I go to a different town. Uh, but people, <laughs> people are curious, and it's good. It's good yes. that people want to know. So. All righty, then. I think our job here is done. Motion to <laughs> adjourn. So moved. Move. I hear a second. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. All those in favor may shut off their computers. <laughs> Say I first. Good night. Bye. Good night all. Bye. Thank you all very much. See you next Bye. week. Take care, guys. Can't wait.